So the clients handed you a piece of music, and this is something I like to call the client cantus firmus. Back in the day when everybody was learning how to write counterpoint, they would give a fixed melody. And then you would do these exercises where you would write note against note. Sometimes it would be in the top voice, sometimes it would be in the lower voice. So I like to call this the client canis firmus. They've handed you a fixed melody. And what do you do? You have to learn how to have that conversation with these things that you can't change. So spend time with the music. Commit it to memory. S learn it at your instrument. My particular process is I sing everything because it's the closest I can get without having a tool in front of me outside of my own body and voice. There's no, nothing holding me back from just being connected and singing that line. And then second to that, I'll move to the piano and I'll figure out what melodies I've been singing and then I'll commit them to paper. I think it's incredibly important to spend that time uh, in a very organic way, away from the technology, away from the computer, so that you are only immersed in the music, in, in the characteristics about that music that make it special. Um, and you do your best to Try to spend time with it. Try to learn the ins and outs of why something may work. That's the client Canis Firmus idea, is that these things are not going to change. It's how much time you commit to spending time with those things that won't change and discovering what about them works and what about them you wish you could change desperately, but you can't. Play the sixteenths. Uh, yes, D flat one sixteen. E flat, e flat one seventeen. D flat one eighteen. One nineteen is E flat. Uh -huh. And then uh, play the octave. Uh, when you're talking about what the client hands you, oftentimes you're not necessarily stuck, but they're going to hand you something that's challenging you or stretching you. One of those moments on Anthem was when Jeff handed me the voicings from New Guards. Actually, he handed the pianist, which then played them. But the voicings are... I mean, you have... This was the big problematic sound for me. How do you write beautiful stuff around that? It's beautiful resolution. But that's what the melody was so you know I sat with that for a long time thinking you know it's beautiful cantabile pastoral moment that was handed to me and then handed to the pianist and played verbatim. You have to work around that client cantus firmus, this, this thing that they've essentially locked you into and find a way to, to bring out of it what is there. So to me, the thing that stood out was this beautiful melody. Da -de -da -da. We don't even have to sing it in time. Da -da -da. Da -de -da 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 -da. So I wanted to create a counter melody there to enhance that story, almost like, I don't know, you know, you're standing at a graveside or you're paying homage or, or something, whatever imagery. Jeff and I were both on the same wavelength there. So I started to sing this line. Do Jeff's line. Ba -da -da. Ba -da -dum, and then I rise out kind of from the underneath. So I started singing it, had it in my head, and then I sat down and started thinking, how can I get around this low end 
And so one of the things that I did was voice around this by creating just simple open voice triad. So Misha's playing this in the piano and I'm playing this. So together it all sounds like this. But it's this clustery thing when it's in the homogenous version of the piano. All the notes sound the same, but the minute you separate it and those are strings and this is piano, it's just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And so Jeff, do da dum, da 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 And all this was written at the piano, just sitting, chording, singing the lines, da da, open voice like a triad. And then these pastoral kind of, you know, it all starts here. This is, this is where it all comes together. Those moments that are particularly special or you have something to say, you absolutely, you have to sit down and get in this intimate space mm -hmm. where uh, you can find your answers because they're definitely there, but you, you have to spend the time searching. So this melody occurs multiple times. It comes around in three separate iterations, one after the other. So what we're doing is we're taking that melody, we're laying back, we're holding off until the next time it comes around. We're focusing on being lyrical. We're focusing on a counter line. We're just adding one little piece to that story. Here it comes around for the second time. We're gonna add a little bit more to it, a little more melodic. Taking time to create space for the melody. Now the story is continuing. And we say, we've gone on this journey. How do I build this up? How do I conclude this? One of the most effective ways to do that, the high use of the violins, the beautiful, grandiose thing, that moment when it all comes together. Triple octaves, we're using violins, and violas in a, in a double octave. Stating the melody one final time, all octaves. Now, here comes the most important part. We get the full ensemble playing the melody in its entirety, completely. Up to this point, we haven't done that with our ensemble. It's only been in the saxophone. So we didn't spoil it. We didn't do it too early. We held off. We took the journey and we say something changed. Something changed in the character. Now we've arrived at a point of conclusion. The concepts, you'll find them inside of the, the literature. I mean, you have to look at literature um, constantly. I mean, all the great composers, you know, we're talking about Tchaikovsky. I'm sure Williams was looking at Tchaikovsky and then I'm looking at Tchaikovsky and Williams. We we're all drawing from each other and saying, what, what's working? And you have to, that's how you, you um, that's how you give something to the composer. That's how you meet them at that place. That's how it becomes your baby. That's how it becomes the thing that you're both sharing and working forward in. Uh, that's really what being an arranger is about. That's really what being a composer is about. Uh, whether you're lucky enough to get to arrange another person's music, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure working with great composers, but if you're a composer yourself, you have to do the exact same things. And 
sometimes it's easier to actually be locked in to what another person has kind of voiced out. That way you're literally thinking as an extension. But ultimately, I think educating yourself and finding the tradition and using the techniques, because these guys didn't use computers. They sat down at their instruments or they sang.